And now from Pisa, we go to the nearby Florence, where Renaissance will begin. Florence has a number of Romanesque buildings, the most striking of which is the baptistry, the octagonal baptistry that sits right in front of the cathedral. And it was begun in uh, mid-11th century. And its appearance is so classical that uh, a number of people uh, into Renaissance and later were absolutely convinced that it was originally a Roman temple. Well, it is proven today beyond doubt that it was not. However, the foundations most possibly were, the foundations are definitely Roman. And um, it is octagonal. The stripe effect here, especially on these pilasters here that are wrapped around the corners, in fact, the zebra effect will not be done until the 13th century. And uh, the Romanesque buildings use the striped effect, uh, well, very effectively. Uh, the uh, white marble, the Carrara marble, was uh, the quarries were not far from Pisa, and uh, then the green marble, also the quarries are not far from Florence, so they had uh, ample amount of both white marble and green, green marble, and the Florentines, of course, put it to beautiful effect. Uh, underneath there is a pointed cupola and then which is covered outside from the outside by the octagonal roof made entirely of uh, white marble. The pilasters here done of green marble they also have perfectly carved Corinthian capitals. Uh, nowhere in Roman arch architecture do we find this kind of abstract effect so that was definitely Romanesque. Uh, effect. And of course the most non-classical feature, if you see here the little blind arcades that you see here, uh, uh, the arcade itself, the arc, is not in fact sitting even visually on the support. The support exists by itself and the arcade exists by itself, which almost reminds one of um, of, of interlace designs because so so whimsical and so unsubordinated to classical motifs. Otherwise, the uh, impression that uh, the baptistry makes is uh, that of uh, of beautiful serenity again, uh, beautiful rationality, uh, symmetry, all of the above. Um, this baptistry served essentially as a church for many centuries and it, this is where the, all the newborn of Florence were baptized because the cathedral, the uh, foundation stone was laid around the 1300 and it will take over a hundred years to build the cathedral and uh, the dome will not be finished until the 15th century and the facade that we can just glimpse the facade of the cathedral will not in fact uh, be installed until the 19th century so it was really the baptistry that served as a church for the longest time in Florence. Inside here is the pointed octagonal uh, vault as you see here and it represents the last judgment. We saw many last judgments in the timpana of the cathedrals. Here the Last Judgment is done in mosaic in the vault of the cathedral. Right here in a very large circle sits Christ. He sits on uh, this arch of the universe and to the right of him would be the righteous, to the left of him would be the sinners and the entire dome is dedicated to that. It's fascinating. They um, they very obligingly have a mirror that one can look in and uh, the mirror allows one to see the ceiling without craning one's neck. And the inside also has these uh, beautiful uh, two-color designs. Uh, right here the chevrons and uh, other designs also are not classical. They also are reminiscent of interlace, geometric interlace. In fact, and the light comes here through the um, clerestory. Uh, 
a fascinating building. And here it is, and you can see here a uh, plan of the ceiling, right here, here sits Christ, and the last judgment is to his left and to his right. Uh, the last judgment is right here. The number two is where the lantern is. The lantern that we see here. Then the choirs uh, of angels are around the lantern. Then the four, number four is stories from the book of Genesis. Then five stories of Joseph. Then stories of Mary and Christ in number six. And then stories of, of course, St. John the Baptist. Right here, since that is a baptistry and all baptistries are dedicated to St. John the Baptist. Um, but on the right and the left of Christ is the Last Judgment. And uh, once you have your PowerPoints, you can look at it um, more carefully and, uh, and see what's what. It's all very beautifully done. And it's done, most probably, by the um, Byzantine artists, because even with Monte Cassino, when St. Benedict established the monastery, here we are in the 11th century, and uh, 500 years passed since the um, fall of the Roman Empire. All the artists, whatever artists there were, left long before for Constantinople. And it was in the Byzantine Empire that art flourished. Well, we looked at it uh, previously with certain interruptions. But at least the uh, skill of art was continuously uh, maintained there. So it was St. Benedict, in fact, who very much believed in uh, decorative arts and in art in general, who began to import Byzantine artists, uh, mosaicists, uh, fresco painters, what have you. And so all the early churches, really, uh, into the 11th century, and even after that, were done, many of them, at least the majority of them, were decorated by um, Byzantine artists. Still another very Romanesque church is San Miniato al Monte. It's really a spectacular church, uh, and it's located spectacularly. It is up on the hill, and from San Miniato one can look at the entire Florence and at, this is this is the dome that was constructed by the architect Brunelleschi in the 15th century which completed the building but we are standing right now at San Miniato uh, and here it is and here is the church now a basilica just a plain basilica uh, uh, plan has uh, has an awkward designation of sorts and sometimes it's difficult to superimpose a facade on it but what the um, architects of uh, San Miniato did they connected the sort of the two facades with these triangles so as a result we have this beautiful uh, row of arcades on the first story right here and then superimposed on top of that story of arcades is another facade, sort of a small temple where a window serves almost as a door right here and then these two windows uh, look as windows uh, with the mosaic uh, that is uh, laid out uh, on top of the pedimented window. And all of this looks rather classical even though as I said we don't find this double colored marble decoration in Rome. But then when you look at these triangles that are decorated again with the crisscross bronze, uh, that takes us back to geometric interlace and reminds us that no, this is not ancient Rome, we are definitely in times medieval. Such is San Miniato. It has three entrances and interestingly again it looks sort of almost like a Roman aqueduct. Uh, and uh, on each side of the main entrance are blind windows and then two more entrances on each side of the facade. Here you can see it from the side. And uh, here it is as we walk up and here's the view of Florence. 
and here's the inside, and the inside is absolutely magnificent. Again, the um, the dual color is uh, is employed throughout. The roof is a timber roof. There is, there's no bolting here, and uh, it is done as um, as a Roman basilica, except of course it's decorated uh, somewhat differently than the Roman basilica. Has this spectacular decorative ceiling and. Uh, one is just as amazed uh, by looking up as uh, by looking looking around. It's uh, one of these beautiful, beautiful places. Um, the floor again is a medieval floor and uh, and done in um, multicolored marble. Here's the ceiling, just for you to look at. It's very, it's very lovely. We have already gone to Montreal when we looked at um, Byzantine art. But uh, it is Byzantine, as I said, because Byzantine artists uh, were hired by these Norman kings who conquered Sicily, right here, in the 11th century, at the end of the 11th century. Uh, you may remember that before the year uh, 1066, when the Normans conquered England in 1030, they came to southern Italy and uh, they fought the Byzantines there, possessed south, uh, southern Italy, and then crossed the Straits of Messina right here into Sicily towards the end of the century, and then by the beginning of the 12th century. Uh, became kings of Sicily and established a spectacular civilization there, sort of an early Renaissance, where so many cultures intermingled uh, uh, Western Christians, Eastern Christians, Jews, Muslims, uh, uh, tolerance was extended to all. And uh, as a result, buildings also involved uh, people of all sorts of cultures. We looked at the Monreale Cathedral. Perhaps you remember. Now, the entrance is was done in the Baroque period. Was, was the entrance was added in the 17th century, but everything else uh, was done uh, in the 12th century, and the church was built, as you see, uh, pretty much as a fortress. Uh, here it is. We looked at the architectural and artistic style of the cathedral. It is very much peculiar to Sicily. It's called Norman Arab Byzantine, underlining the fact that the building in itself is a vivid reflection of uh, the island's uh, turbulent and multicultural uh, medieval history. Here are the arches, as you see. They all overlap, which is a very Islamic design. Here it is again. And much of the decoration is also influenced both by the Byzantines and by, by Islam. Here's the cathedral as one sees it from the outside, and here's the apse. We're looking at the apse portion of uh, the cathedral. And even the plan itself is a mixture of Eastern Rite and Roman Catholic arrangement. The nave is like an Italian basilica right here, while the large triple apsed choir, here it is, here's the choir, and it has three apses. Here's the main apse and then each apse on the side. Uh, is like one of the early three apse churches, of which so many examples still exist in Syria and other eastern churches. It is in fact like two quite different churches uh, put together uh, endwise, uh, but uh, it works extremely well and the interior is covered with the most spectacular uh, mosaics that, uh, that were done by the Byzantine artists. It was built by William II after the English um, uh, Archbishop of Palermo sought, with the solid backing of the Pope, to assert his authority over the king by refusing to honor his father's wishes to be buried in Cefalo, another town in Sicily in the north, instead of interring him in Palermo Cathedral, in which case William immediately set about building a bigger and more artistically inspired cathedral, appointing his own archbishop and making his cathedral the royal pantheon. 
The results survive today almost exactly as built in the 1100s. At this point, uh, a struggle began between the papacy and uh, secular rulers as to, well, who is uh, stronger and who is more powerful. This struggle goes back to, uh, to Charlemagne, who was crowned emperor in the year 800, if you remember, in Rome. In fact, to that purpose, he crossed the Alps, came to Rome, and was crowned. Uh, at the time, there was no question as to the emperor, Holy Roman Emperor, uh, being stronger than the Pope of Rome, who didn't have his own troops and really only had the spiritual authority to maintain himself. But uh, by the uh, 12th century, things will change, and uh, a number of mercenaries would be very happy to help the uh, cause of the Pope and a great investiture struggle began uh, even earlier on, the 11th century really, between the popes and secular rulers as to who is authorized to invest bishops, who is authorized to invest uh, local clerics with important positions. Uh, are the rulers, secular rulers, authorized or must they ask permission of the pope? As you can imagine, uh, the Pope insisted on his authority, but then the secular rulers were not uh, happy about it. In fact, uh, the story of Romeo and Juliet uh, is part of that story, because one family was uh, the associates of the Pope, and the other family were the associates of the Emperor, the Montecchi and Capuleti and thus the struggle that, of course, entered into every concern of, uh, of society. But here it is, and this is part of it. That's this whole struggle between William II and, uh, and his archbishop, because archbishop was now maintaining his power, whereas William II wouldn't hear of it. And uh, so as a result of the struggle, this incredible cathedral was built with its absolutely spectacular mosaics. And uh, one, in fact, the clothes are easier to do it in books, of course, than, uh, than looking at the walls. When one looks at the walls, when one is actually there, it's the cumulative effect that's overwhelming. When one wants to study it uh, mosaic by mosaic, then of course it's easier to do with books, but it's very clear what's represented. Um, at the end is uh, Christ Pantocrator, whom I had uh, shown you before. The ceiling is timber ceiling, beautifully decorated timber ceiling, and the whole plan is that of a Roman basilica, but with that uh, triple apse uh, in the choir, as according to the eastern rite. Here, you may look at the, at the ceiling here. It's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, every little inch is, uh, is decorated. Well, obviously this is you know, restored, but uh, restored hopefully to its original condition, or anything uh, very similar to its original condition. And here is the close-up. This is done in registers. Uh, this is uh, Christ Pantocrator, the All-Powerful. Underneath is the Chair of the Holy Wisdom, which shows Mary with Christ's Child in her lap, and then various saints underneath um, that. The cloister is spectacular in the cathedral, and uh, its uh, capitals are very beautiful, uh, the column capitals, but the, the columns themselves are done in uh, multicolored marbles with a great uh, deal of fantasy and a great deal of design. Uh, here we have it, and the pointed arches, in fact, the, this speak uh, more of an Islamic design than the Gothic design, but then Gothic design will look at Islamic designs uh, in, in, a, in its own aspirations. Here are the columns, all different, all carved differently or encrusted with mosaics differently in an uh, unending array of pattern. Right there. Uh, a number of capitals are Corinthian capitals, but then other capitals are very whimsical, Romanesque, capitals that show all sorts of creatures in addition to saintly uh, stories. Here they are, as you see. 
here are all the incrustation mosaic incrustation whether done on diagonal or straight or swirling and then others and others are just entirely and completely carved and here is an array of uh, most extraordinary carvings on the, on the capitals and uh, one really one, one goes dizzy when uh, one walks around uh, those cloisters but but the the whole uh, complex of a building and its cloister is is um, is heavenly and one does begin to think uh, as if one is in the house of uh, God which well which is what the church was supposed to be just as uh, temples in ancient Rome were supposed to be um, a great book to read it's a very thick book but it's a fascinating book and it's by John Julius Norwich and it's called Normans in Sicily or the story of the other Norman conquest because everybody knows about 1066 and the Norman invasion of, of England where William the Conqueror crossed over into England and defeated King Harold but uh, many do not know about a conquest by the same people by the Normans of the southern Italy and Sicily which will be known together as a kingdom of two Sicilies uh, and uh, well here's the book to read and it's um, it's brilliant and this is the kingdom of two Sicilies as of about the middle of the 12th century right here and southern Italy was included in that kingdom and now that we looked at Romanesque architecture we should look um, at other arts such as sculpture and painting and one of the uh, great examples of Romanesque sculpture that came down to us uh, comes from the Meuse River Valley, right here. It's contemporary uh, Belgium. And here is uh, here's the Meuse River, right here, the town of Liège. And to, that's the Duchy of Lower Lorraine, or at the time it was called Lotharingia. Uh, or Lotharingia, after the name of uh, one of Charlemagne's grandsons who inherited this area. So the river is the Meuse River right here and uh, it was famed at the time for its bronze work. This is a baptismal font, something that would sit in the middle of a baptistry, something that would sit in the middle of something like uh, the baptistry of St. John, for instance, in Florence, and this is the vessel where the children would be baptized. And uh, baptismal font at St. Bartholomew's Church in Liège, Belgium, and it was made uh, sometime in the early 12th century. The font itself is a major uh, masterpiece of Mosan art, and Mosan comes from the, the name of the river. And it is very, very classical. In, to look at. There is a great deal of classicism to it. The figures on the uh, font are in very high relief. They're, well, they're not three-dimensional. Well, they are three-dimensional. It's just that they are not figures in the round. They're still attached to the background, but they're in very high relief. And uh, I forget whether I talked or not about the relief sculpture. Sculpture can be just basic sculpture that you can walk around uh, or this pointer is basic sculpture or sculpture can be part of a wall and depending on uh, how much it projects from the wall it is said that it is relieved from the wall and could be a high relief or very low relief and in this case this is quite high the relief is quite high very hairy and classical in style, so much so that it has also been suggested that it was uh, in fact made in Constantinople by the Greeks uh, or by the Greeks in Rome around the year 1000. And frankly, we really don't know. 300 years after it was made, it was attributed to one Rainier of who, who was at the time uh, master uh, bronze smith and a register from uh, the 14th century, I think, attributes it 
to him. It is a large bowl supported on, originally there were 12 uh, half bowls, but uh, today there are 10. You can see that two are missing. And uh, the figures, in fact, are very naturalistic. Uh, it is a reference to the sea of cast metal mounted on 12 oxen made for King Solomon, according to Kings 723, and adorned with scenes appropriate for the uh, sacrament of baptism. The figures, as I said, are very naturalistic, and uh, we do not know about Renier because little we know that he was uh, an extraordinary uh, bronze smith, but little other work is really attributed to him. So classical is this font that uh, there's still doubt whether it was not made in Constantinople. Here it is in the center is the scene of the baptism of Christ. Right here, this is St. John the Baptist. And up above is the head of God the Father, the head, again, not the hand, but the head of God the Father, foreshortened, as he is uh, leaning over the celestial ark here to look at the goings-on. And when one looks at the figure right here, it's just a completely classical figure. This figure has contraposto, the, uh, the classical balance of, uh, of its uh, component parts. Uh, this figure could very easily uh, jump off the uh, Ghiberti doors. That will not happen until the 15th century, right here. Uh, which is why this, um, this particular font is uh, such a marvel. Another fascinating sculpture that comes to us uh, from the Romanesque period is this horseman in the town of Bamberg in Germany, and it is early 13th century. It's an equestrian statue by, this time, an anonymous medieval sculptor. And it's still there in the cathedral. Here it is. It's uh, attached to one of the piers. It's quite large, the statue. What's fascinating about it is that this is probably the very first example that we have of an equestrian statue where horse and rider are done on the same scale. A convention was established back in the uh, middle of the 5th century BC in Athens by a great sculptor, Phidias, in his uh, work on the uh, uh, Temple of Parthenon in Athens, whereby riders and horses were done on different scales. Horses were done on a smaller scale than the riders. But as long as they were done magnificently and very true to reality, one really doesn't see it. And Phidias did it so that he would fit more of the riders on his frieze. But so great was his name and so unassailable his reputation that after Phidias, in all equestrian statues, and that included Roman equestrian statues as well, riders and horses were done on different scales. Even uh, the one famous example that we have uh, that, that survived from uh, antiquity, and that is uh, the equestrian statue of uh, Marcus Aurelius, which is in, um, in Rome today, still is done on a different scale. This is the first example that we have that where horse and rider are actually done on the same scale. And, uh, well, here it is. It is still there in Bomberg where one can see it, as I said. Uh, everything else about the cathedral is um, medieval, is Gothic. Uh, even uh, this little uh, model of uh, a medieval city above the writer's head is, um, is Gothic. Uh, here he is, the horseman, early 13th century, stone equestrian statue, and uh, a very sensitive face, uh, the face that could have been carved from nature, from an actual model. 
uh, looks uh, pensive, looks uh, alert, looks aware of possible danger. A beautiful statue altogether. Here is the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius that I just spoke about and uh, that was uh, cast in uh, in the second century, towards the end of the second century AD, therefore there's a thousand years that separates these two. It's in Rome, in the Capitol Museums, and as I said, uh, it's hard to tell from the slide, but you can look at the statue online and you can see how the horse is done to a smaller ratio than uh, a rider himself. The reason uh, it survived, it's the only question statue that survived uh, from the Roman times, is because uh, well, bronze was expensive and uh, ultimately uh, bronze statues, of which there were very many in Rome and even more in Greece, were all melted down to coin, uh, to use as coin, to use as weapons, to use um, uh, in uh, other applications. Still another Romanesque sculpture that is of great interest to us is the, uh, the so-called uh, brow spike lion right here. It is bronze again. It's, bro it's an icon of, uh, of the city due to its great historical importance. It was commissioned by Henry the Lion who ruled as Duke of Saxony and later as Duke of Bavaria, which is southern Germany, and was perhaps the most legendary ruler of, uh, of his time. Uh, and this is the 12th century, mid-12th century. The statue made in the middle of the 12th century was meant to be, in fact, uh, a symbol, sort of a mascot of um, Henry's rule and jurisdiction. Uh, originally it was gold-plated and today it is, uh, this is a copy, just as uh, with Marcus Aurelius, outside today sits a copy and the original sits inside. This is the original and um, that's uh, displayed in a castle in the town. And, um, and here one can see the great detail that the great attention that's paid to the lion's mane uh, that is done with incredible uh, degree of uh, sensitivity but also attention to, uh, to, to symmetry and cohesiveness. The, uh, the, the lion's mouth is open, he is roaring, he is exhibiting his strength and then uh, he is also very attractive to our modern eyes because because all the details are reduced to, uh, to essentials. His body, as you see, is almost abstracted in some way to give more prominence to, uh, to his mane. A very interesting uh, example, actually, of Romanesque sculpture is the, uh, the Capitoline Wolf, which uh, for years and years and years, was considered uh, an Etruscan work, uh, a work that was done in 5th century uh, BC. And uh, she also lives in uh, the Capitol Museums, and she is uh, pride of possession of the Capitol Museums, and it's still marked as 5th uh, century BC work by Etruscan uh, bronze smiths. But it appears that wasn't quite the case. It appears that, uh, well, Rome, needless to say, of course, had a bronze she-wolf suckling um, Romulus uh, and Remus. But uh, after due consideration, uh, more and more opinion is now swayed towards thinking that, in fact, it was a Romanesque work. It was uh, a medieval work of 12th century AD. And when we, in fact, compare the Brunswick lion with the Capitoline she-wolf, we see uh, the same tendency uh, to reduce the body of the animal to its essentials. Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, the wolf is sort of done like a lion, which is strange because there are plenty of wolves running around Europe. 
but it is done like a lion, unlike the, Brun the Brunswick lion here, where the mane, in fact, is done in relief. Uh, the, um, the mane on the wolf, which wolves don't have, but the she-wolf is portrayed almost like a lion. Uh, and it's done more as, uh, as uh, engraving than as relief right here. And the two figures here of Romulus and Rebus were added in the, uh, during the Renaissance, during the 15th century uh, later. Here is another image of the same. So um, uh, it's very possible that this, in fact, is another Romanesque sculpture, which is also of great value. It doesn't matter whether well, it matters, of course, whether it's Etruscan or Romanesque, but it's interesting if it is Romanesque. Uh, one man we do know about, definitely, and his name is Benedetto Antelani, and um, he uh, lived in the uh, late 12th, early 13th century, and uh, for uh, the facade of the Fidenza Cathedral, he did a couple of sculptures. One of them right here is a sculpture of David, and uh, he is shown with a scroll. He is shown as conducting a prophecy of sorts. His head is turned uh, to a side, and he seems to be lost in thought. And he is also shown right under the pre presentation of Christ at the temple. So in this case, the Old Testament and the New Testament, again, are combined. Uh, the, uh, it is uh, carved out of stone and the cascades of hair together with the cascades of drapery are beautifully done with a great deal of skill and mastery. So it is um, uh, no surprise that he was considered to be one of the most important artists of the Romanesque period and of course we are extremely lucky to to have his name, because even the Renier de Rui, uh, with the baptismal font in, in the Meuse River, you're not really sure that it was him. Uh, 200 years will pass after the um, casting of the font that uh, somebody else attributed to work the work to him. So thus, King David here, he, even earlier, before he did King David, he uh, did, for the Cathedral of Parma, he did this beautiful, beautiful carving of um, deposition. Uh, after Christ was crucified, then he dies on the cross, then the deposition happens. And this is the moment of deposition. Usually in deposition we see Virgin Mary, we see uh, Saint John the Evangelist, we also see Nicodemus and Saint Joseph of Arimathea. Those were the two wealthy Jews who helped in taking Christ down from the cross. We also see often mourners on the one side and Roman soldiers dividing the seamless robe of Christ on the other side. And this is what we see here. Um, Christ is being taken from the cross by either Nicodemus or St. Joseph of Arimathea here. Then on his side, right there, there's Mary, St. John, mourners are here. The angels, beautifully, the angel here on our left is in fact holding Christ's hand, sort of helping take him from the cross, which creates almost musical cadences and uh, the row of mourners with their drapery also creates this, this very lovely musical rhythm right here. On the other hand, here are the Romans who are dividing the uh, uh, Christ's seamless uh, robe, but also are shown as respectful to what is happening. All of this is superimposed against this uh, spectacular carving of vines in the background. And uh, Meredith Antilami's name is right here above uh, Christ's left arm. Still another church in, um, uh, in the south is, uh, is built in the hills near Capua, 
which is near Naples, and the view from that church on clear days actually extends into the Bay of Naples. One could see the island of, of Ischia, which is uh, quite extraordinary in itself. It was built, as so many of these churches were built, uh, over uh, an ancient temple of Diana, which was the most important pre-Christian sanctuary in the region. And it has frescoes, uh, which is very, very rare, and that in itself is extraordinary. It has frescoes that represent some of Italy's uh, finest uh, Romanesque pictorial cycles. And here we have it. It's a Romanesque basilica. It's a Roman basilica, Romanesque basilica, but also a Roman basilica, as you see. And this is the view of the nave right here, and the uh, fresco cycles are on the side. And uh, we're looking at the, uh, the end of the 11th century. Here is one of them, and Christ here is painted as triumphant. There is no sign of pain uh, on him. On one side is Mary, and Mary is, in fact, given a bit of a um, painterly slash to show her tears. And on the other side is shown Saint John. He's shown as a monk. Uh, this is what is known as cluster heads. Uh, this is a device whereby, by uh, showing so many tops of heads, the idea of a crowd is conveyed. And these are the crowd. Uh, these are all mourners, and the mourners here are very interestingly juxtaposed with the Roman soldiers, who in fact are given. That's also a cluster head, but they're given more features. But while the mourners are all standing very consistently, as one can see, the soldiers here too, they are dividing the seamless robe, uh, robe of Christ, while the other ones are somewhat in disarray. And there's only one of them right here who just turns around and he is looking at the crucifixion and it's almost as if he is um, converted right there on the spot because he is looking at a miracle and then angels on uh, each side. It's, uh, it's rather amazing that we have them because the majority of these frescoes, of course, disappeared. And still uh, another spectacular church, the Abbey of San Pietro al Monte, and this one now is in the north. It's at the foot of the Alps, right here. And here, too, is uh, an amazing fresco. It shows uh, Christ in the middle, in, uh, in the mandorla, which is an almond-shaped halo, but that embraces the entire figure right here. And we also see he, he, him surrounded by angels, and also St. George. Here is St. George, right, who is defeating evil. He is defeating the dragon. And the dragon is done with a great deal of fantasy. On this side, uh, we see Virgin Mary giving birth to Christ himself. And it's done with beautiful, beautiful colors. And then, of course, something of which we do have uh, a goodly number, there are medieval manuscripts. Uh, the illuminated medieval manuscripts. Illumination means decoration with, uh, with pictures. That's what illumination is. And many of the manuscripts that came down to us are illuminated by monks. Sort of the monks as uh, began to do it uh, at Monte Cassino, as uh, set down by the rules of uh, St. Benedict. Uh, where scriptoria were organized, where monks uh, spent their time doing these illustrations and copying the Bible. And on the left, we have the Pentecost, and this one is from a Cluny uh, lectionary, because the monastery of Cluny, of course, had very considerable scriptorium. And it goes, it, uh, goes back to the mid-12th century, and here we see Christ right here, and he is resurrected, and we see him here, as we saw him at Vesele, where the rays from him go to all the apostles as they are bid to go around the world to convert the nations, which is called the 
Pentecost, right here. And on, uh, on our right is uh, St. Matthew uh, from a different codex, comes from about 11th century. And this is where one's fantasy just uh, went on an adventure. Uh, the capital letters were very, very uh, were considered extremely important, and very often the capital letters were greatly decorated. And there we see decorations very similar to the Hebrew and the Saxon manuscripts. So this is the letter L, and the decorations around the letter has absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. All the decorations come from more of a pagan imagination. There are various creatures here. It's all symmetrical, but there are various creatures here, birds. Uh, there is someone who is nude, somebody else, uh, more creatures standing on top of one another, more of an animal interlace. Uh, this truly is uh, uh, as if sprung from Hiberno Saxon manuscripts. And uh, St. Matthew here, there must be an angel nearby because that's how we know that this is St. Matthew by his attribute, which is an angel. Here's St. Mark, and we immediately see the lion here. And this comes from an abbey of Corby, also early 12th century. And uh, he is depicted uh, as overcome by emotion, overcome also by... Uh, inspiration as the line is whispering into his ear. The way the line is depicted is really amazing because he twists as he is inspiring St. Mark. Up above we see his, uh, his pose turning up, whereas his head then twists and faces St. Mark himself. And St. Mark too, his entire body, uh, twists just to pay attention to the line and we see it by the swirling of drapery, by this very energetic, very lovely swirling of drapery. Um, whereas here is the right initial I from still another manuscript. It shows, first of all, it shows monks at work, and monks did everything. They did, yes, they copied manuscripts, but uh, manual labor was also extremely important. They cleared forests, they drained uh, swamps, they cut down trees, they were carpenters, they were plumbers, uh, they, uh, they were masters of, uh, of all trades, essentially. But what's funny here is that here are the two monks and one of them is cutting down the tree while another one is, um, is axing off various branches, but he's about to fall down together with the tree. So many of them are very, very humorous. Still, this is much more decorative and uh, ceremonial, uh, sort of almost Byzantine. And it is uh, St. John the Evangelist uh, from the Gospel book of Abbot uh, Vendricus uh, from about the uh, middle of the 12th century. Uh, we know it is St. John because there's an eagle here, and the uh, eagle is the attribute of St. John. Uh, done against the beautiful gold background with Byzantine swirls. There is very clearly Byzantine influence here. And then uh, surrounded by, by lovely leaves and lovely plant life, he is actually shown as dipping into an inkwell that is given to him by Abbot Vendricus himself. And we know it because it says here, Vendricus, right there. So there's the abbot who is in fact offering him the inkwell while St. John is dipping his quill into it. Um, quite lovely. Uh, we see the baptism here and various other figures. In this case, there's only a hand of God that appears. Whereas this one is fascinating uh, because it shows the mouth of hell. And in the mouth of hell, are squirming the sinners and uh, in this case a number of them are in the nude because that's how the sinners must be represented in hell and this too is where uh, an illustrator's fantasy is given free reign. So when we think of Bosch, the German uh, fantastical painter of the 16th century, uh, we can just see how his imagination in his turn 
was perhaps uh, inspired by these medieval manuscripts and such images as uh, as this one where we see Satan on the outside with some animal interlace just like the Hiberno-Saxon manuscripts and then inside uh, the, the uh, here's an angel who is locking the door so they cannot possibly escape and um, and they are undergoing torture and various other punishments uh, inside the mouth of Satan really quite uh, fascinating still another one this is a fascinating letter R uh, you perhaps remember from um, the Hiberna Saxon lecture from migration art we looked at Cairo Yota from uh, from the book of Kells here is uh, the uh, letter R and this is from a 12th century uh, manuscript that lives in France in the town of Dijon and what they see is a knight right here who is very valiantly swinging his sword which and, and he represents the back of the letter R right here uh, the rest of the letter is represented by a dragon so this presumably is Saint George and uh, but uh, his valiance is of, um, of no use really because his servant had already pierced the dragon with his lance right there. Meanwhile, St. George is kind of exhibiting himself. Uh, we see one of his legs in the blue hose. He is standing sort of like the, um, the Hollywood starlets who, uh, who have all their dresses cut, cut up to, to the waist when they put out the, uh, the leg. And this is very much as St. George stands as well. The book of Deuteronomy, on the other hand, uh, comes from England, again, 12th century. We see Moses and Aaron here. Uh, Deuteronomy is the Jewish law. And here's Moses uh, teaching the law to the Hebrews that uh, he had obtained by... Um, well, by going up to Mount Sinai and bringing down the Ten Commandments, and Aaron is standing there interpreting, and then on uh, at the bottom he is uh, pointing at a pig-like creature again, telling the Hebrews that uh, that cannot be eaten. All done in spectacular colors with beautiful, beautiful borders. And last but not least is one of the most fascinating uh, items from the Romanesque period, which is an embroidery. It is called the Bayo Tapestry. It's not actually tapestry, it's an embroidery. In tapestry, the design and the cloth itself are woven together. Embroidery, one takes the cloth and then embroiders. The Bayo Tapestry commemorates a struggle for the throne of England. I mentioned uh, the Norman conquest before when we talked about the Palermo Cathedral, when we talked about uh, William the Conqueror uh, who defeated the Herald at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Well, this is what this tapestry is about. It was ordered by Bishop Odo of Bayo, who may have been uh, a relative of William the Conqueror and a struggle for the throne of England between William and Harold, the Earl of um, Wessex. The year, as I said, is 1066 uh, that William advanced into England and conquered uh, Harold. And the tapestry is uh, quite extraordinary. It really begins with the story of Harold who who goes out on some sort of perhaps pleasure trip uh, to the English Channel, then blown by uh, he is blown by a storm to the French shores, becomes prisoner of William, and there a promise is extracted from Harold that uh, he will willingly transfer the throne of England to William because he was a relative of a previous king and Edward the Confessor and that William has greater rights to the throne than Harold does, then Harold is allowed to go. 
But then, of course, the moment he reaches England, he assumes the throne, William is unhappy, and then this, the whole story continues with, uh, with every detail, how the army is being uh, brought together, how uh, the comet is seen in the sky and uh, judged as, uh, as a good sign. Uh, how the horses are loaded into the boats, how the crossing happens, and then the horses uh, come off the boats, then the battle, then the defeat, everything. Everything is described. It's really fascinating. Uh, the tapestry consists of 75 scenes, some with Latin inscriptions that are called tituli. Here you can have them. You can see them depicting the events leading up to the conquest and culminating in the Battle of Hastings itself in the year 1066. The textile end is now missing, but most probably showed the coronation of William as uh, King of England. And uh, here we uh, see, in fact, all the people, they're feasting here, and uh, here are the cooks that are making the dinner. Here is William himself, and everything is specified, so we know who is who. And uh, we know when messengers are sent from William to Harold, from Harold to William. And here, what appears to be the comet, right there, that everybody uh, marvels at. Here is King Harold, again, shown. He is told about the comet. Everybody can see it. The tapestry was probably made in uh, Canterbury uh, around 1070, shortly after the events, which makes it all the more fascinating because the events were still very, very fresh in everybody's mind. Because, yes, because the tapestry was made within a generation of, um, of the victory, it's considered to be um, an accurate representation. Based on a few key pieces of evidence, art historians believe that the patron was Odo, Bishop of Bayeux, half-brother of William, Duke of uh, Normandy. And here you see the actual battle. Um, we don't know who did the design. The embroidery was possibly done by the nuns. And uh, uh, it was done with great skill. We see here uh, warriors who are dying in foreshortening right here. Horses are falling. Uh, then uh, the uh, soldiers are battling one another. And here are the Angli and the Franchi, and they are all battling. And then on the borders, up on top, there, there is fantastical creatures. Uh, here is a falconer, there's a detail, uh, and it's embroidered wool on linen. It is 20 inch uh, high. And you see, uh, we can see the falconer himself, the falcon, the horses, all done with great detail. In fact, the art historians can understand the weapons that were used and the armor that was used in this battle. Here is how it is exhibited today. Uh, it's exhibited in the, uh, the Museum of Tapestry in Bayeux itself, in Normandy, which is very close to Cayenne, where, where we saw, saw architecture of the Cathedral of Cayenne. This is, uh, this is it for our Romanesque lectures. We will move on next time, and uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you very much.